Hey guys, in this video we're going to be looking at Unit 2 for your OCR Gateway Biology Scaling Up. This is a quick video going over the things that you need. There is a longer version for the whole of Paper 1 and the whole of Paper 2. If you want to follow along with a checklist, then that's free to download from my website. When we're talking about diffusion, we are talking about things moving from a high concentration down the diffusion gradient to an area of low concentration. This could be things moving from an area inside a cell where they've been made to another area, or it could be things moving out of a cell. For example, it could be um, happening in the lungs, so these are the alveoli, the air spaces, and this is the capillary travelling around it. These are very, very thin, uh, walls only one cell thick, and carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood into the lungs so that it can be breathed out and oxygen is going to diffuse from the lungs into the blood so it can be taken around the body. All this can be in the gut, these are the villi of the gut, this is the gut cavity here and you notice again they are one cell thick and just like the LVO they have a very large surface area. We're going to get digested food moving from the gut cavity into the blood so that it can be taken around the rest of the body. So diffusion is the movement of gases or any particles that dissolved in solution moving down a concentration gradient from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis is specifically the movement of water through a partially permeable membrane from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So you notice this is partially permeable membrane. The uh, pores in it aren't large enough for the um, solute to move through. So the water is going to be the one that moves through here. This sort of thing can happen in root hair cells where we're looking at the uptake of water. Active transport, again, is the movement across a membrane, but it's from, this time, a low concentration to a high concentration against the concentration gradient. So our channel, or active transport channel, is going to pick up something that it wants. It is then going to move that through the channel to the other side. This could happen, for example, when we're talking about glucose in the gut or minerals in roots. In mitosis, we go from one parent cell to two identical daughter cells. The first thing that needs to happen is that the DNA in the nucleus needs to condense into chromosomes and then they need to line up down the middle. Once they're all lined up down the middle and all the checks are taking place to make sure that um, chromosomes aren't going to go astray, they can start to be pulled apart to either end of the cell. New nuclei will form and then they will separate into two identical daughter cells. All cells start off looking the same. So they have your basic cell structure and then various different genes will be turned on and turned off. And that's when it will start to specialise. That's when differentiation will take place and it will grow this really, really long axon or it will grow the villi or it will turn into a leaf cell. Stem cells are fantastic things because they are things that have the potential to turn into any other type of cell. They have a number of different uses. For example, if you're treating Parkinson's disease, they can be used to grow new brain cells. If we're talking about brain or spinal injury, bone injuries, then they can be used to grow new bones to fill the gap. If we have organ failure, we can grow new organs or parts of organs instead of waiting and making someone wait on the incredibly long transplant waiting list. If we want to make stem cells, then we take a nuclei out of an egg cell. We take nuclei from the patient's uh, cell and insert that into the empty egg. The egg can then start to develop into an embryo. From this embryo, the stem cell are then removed and stem cells are turned into new cells. This does come with quite a lot of controversy because human embryos are going to be created and then destroyed. Um, and there are lots of religious objections to this. People just saying that life um, starts when embryos are created and people that object to the destruction of embryos. 
Here we have our respiratory system. Air goes in through the mouth or the nose, down into the trachea, which is also known as the windpipe. Then into the bronchus, which is a branch of the trachea. Into the bronchioli, which is a branch of the bronchus. And into the little grape or cauliflower shaped alveoli. This is where gas exchange happens. And they have an incredibly large surface area. Your diaphragm moves up and down to bring air in and out. The heart pumps blood around the body. The intercostal muscles allow the rib cage to expand. And the ribs, the last part that makes up everything, protects the lungs. Here we have a cardiovascular system and it is a double system. The blood gets pumped from the heart to the lungs, goes back to the heart and then gets pumped around the rest of the body. If you see a picture of the heart, the first thing you do is write right and left on there. We have our vena cava where the blood enters. It goes into the right atrium down through a valve into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it goes up and to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. It comes back into the heart via the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, into the left ventricle and then is pumped to the rest of the body via the aorta. If you want to check you have the path of blood right, then we need to be looking at capital letters. It goes through the vena cava, the atrium, the ventricle, then the artery, back through the vein, into the atrium, to the ventricle, and then the aorta. So it goes vena cava, atrium, ventricle, artery, vein, atrium, ventricle, aorta, V-A-V-A-V-A. -A -A. If you don't have that pattern, you've made a mistake somewhere. Other features of the heart that you need to know are here. These are valves. They will only allow blood to flow. And that this side has a much larger muscle than this side. The right side only needs to pump blood to the lungs, which aren't very far away. But this side has to pump blood to the rest of the body, a much longer distance. The majority of the time, veins carry deoxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries oxygenated blood back into the heart. And the majority of the time, um, arteries carry oxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. If the heart isn't functioning properly, pacemakers, artificial pacemakers, can be introduced to help the heart keep time. Or if somebody has cardiovascular disease, then these tubes can get blocked up. Blood is made up of several components. The actual colour of blood is this pale yellow colour. This is the serum. That's the liquid component of the blood. The cells give it its actual colour. Red blood cells, the cells that give blood its colour, have no nuclei. And this is so they have more space to carry oxygen, which is their main function. White blood cells are part of the immune system. And platelets are fragments of cells and they are important for things like clotting. Arteries have a very thick walls because they are carrying blood under high pressure, which means they have a thin lumen. That's the gap in the middle. Capillaries are very, very small. They are only one cell thick, or very, very thin, I should say. They're only one cell thick. This is to allow for diffusion. They generally go around in this kind of like mesh network around things like the gut, around the villi in the gut, around the alveoli in the lungs, so they have a large surface area. The veins carry deoxygenated blood. They carry it back to the heart, so they have valves. And they have thin walls and a thick lumen because they're carrying blood under low pressure. 
Here we have a cross section of a typical leaf. Our palisade mesophyll where photosynthesis is going to take place. Cuticle which is the waxy layer. Upper and lower epidermis which cover the plant. Spongy mesophyll which is a space for gas exchange. And the guard cell and stomata which is where transpiration takes place. Inside the plant we have the xylem and the phloem. The phloem is going to carry water. This is generally going to be an upwards direction from the roots where it is collected to the leaves where it can be used for photosynthesis and the phloem where it carries ions and food and this is generally in a downwards direction from the leaf where food can be made in photosynthesis to the roots where it can be stored in, for example, potatoes. There are several factors that affect the rate of transpiration and transpiration not only involves water uh, moving out of the stomata but also moving up through the xylem. So if we have bright light that is going to lead to more transpiration. More light means more photosynthesis, which means there's going to need to be more water brought up into the cell. If we have a high temperature, that is going to lead to more transpiration. Because the rate of reaction is going to happen faster. If we have high wind, that is going to lead to more transpiration. Because wind is going to be um, brushing against the leaf or flowing against the leaf, moving things out of the way, so diffusion is going to play a part here. And if we have high humidity, this is going to lead to lower transpiration. Water is going to struggle to leave the leaf because there is a very high concentration of water, it's very humid outside.